don't know. I'm sorry if I'm uh, mispronouncing anybody's name. So, <clears throat> yes, Amal, can we start from you? Yes, I passed like almost one year back part two. Uh-huh. So did you appear before? In what? Three? No, not yet. Okay, okay. So when is your plan? <clears throat> this May, inshallah. Okay, okay. Good, inshallah. Good luck. So uh, you will be going for the physical exam or the online exam? Online. I got online one. Online. Okay. Already you booked for the exam, right? Yes. Okay. Good, good, good. And <laughs> Hafiza, what about you? Hello, ma'am. Uh, I just passed my part two recently, uh -huh. planning to take part three in November. Yeah, it's better part to you three, know, part... go fully prepared for the exam. Take yes. your time because part three is uh, different from part two. Although you, of course, need your applied knowledge, um, but uh, there are several other things which are addressed in part three. So <clears throat> that, you know, you have to attend webinars and practice stations, then only you will feel that you are ready for part three. All right, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Lech Nath Bhatta. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. What about you? Yeah. Uh, hello. Hi. You're from where? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm a first learner. Uh, no, no, you are from uh, India? No, I, I, I live in India from the UK. From where, sorry? But I'm from Nepal. Nepal. I'm from Nepal. Nepal, uh, okay, good. Okay, so uh, when did you pass, Lech? Yeah, no, I haven't passed, but uh, just I'm joining. Uh, I, uh, I'm planning to take uh, in November, yeah. November 2023. Oh. Okay, okay, okay. Good luck to you. Yes, Mariam, Zabin, what about you? Uh, I cleared my part two in July uh, 2022. Uh -huh. And I'm planning to, I'm planning to take uh, Osler in May, coming May. Okay, good luck to you, Mariam. Okay, you. so Mumal, uh, what about you, Mumal? Mumal Swati, what about you people? It's fine, no problem. Okay, all right. So you are just joined. It's good. It's good to have a, you know, understanding of what type uh, the both exams parts are. Good. All right. So uh, uh, let's start, I think. So, you know, uh, I will just give you a brief idea of the part three exam before we start our session. Uh, that in part three says exam, they are testing five domains. So most of you will be aware of those five domains. So number one is the information gathering. Information gathering is your history taking. So number two is your communication with the patient how you are communicating with the patient. So, you know, they are reading not only your verbal language, they're reading your body language. So make sure once you are going for the exam, what you are saying verbally, it should go with your body language as well, okay? If you're being empathetic, just it should appear in your body language as well. Then there is communication with the uh, colleagues. Colleagues means that whoever you want to, you know, uh, refer the patient to, or there is a multidisciplinary team approach. So who all will be part of that multidisciplinary team? Then comes your <clears throat> applied knowledge, which is the most important. If you don't have the knowledge of the topic, you cannot do anything about the station because that is the most important thing. That is the base of everything. And your building is built on your applied knowledge. So that is very, very important. And another very important thing is patient safety in part three exam. There are certain things, in certain uh, points in each topic, which if you miss, you will fail. So patient safety is very, very important in part three exam. So make sure then once you are taking history, you ask for allergies, you confirm the blood group, because if you don't ask for allergy and you are uh, prescribing some medicine, alas, you are failed. Okay, so no matter whatever, how good you perform in other domains, if you 
uh, fail in patient safety, they will not pass you. Because uh, they expect that once you pass part three, you will come to UK and practice there. So they don't know, they don't want the doctors who are not practicing safe medicine. Okay. Any questions so far about the exam pattern? Okay, so no question. Um, you see, you all will have 14 stations, uh, which will be all from the 14 different uh, uh, topics of the, which we will be doing, uh, because I'm doing a course in which we cover all the modules, 14 modules, and uh, all your 14 stations will be from different modules, okay? So you have two minutes of reading time and 10 minutes of performance time. In the physical exam, you have the station outside the cubicle. You are provided with few blank papers and pencil. You will make your own notes in those two minutes. And then the bell rings, you go inside the cubicle, you start performing the station. At the end of the station, 10 minutes, again, the bell rings. And no matter wherever you are, you are supposed to leave that station and go to the next one. So the best thing is not to carry the previous station with you for, to the next station. Otherwise, you know, you will be, if you perform well, you will be overwhelmed. If you are perform uh, under, when you are depressed, you are not happy with your performance, that will carry on and affect your next performance. So forget about whatever happened in the previous station, go to the next station with a fresh mind because the new uh, uh, role player or the consultant doesn't know what you did in the previous station. Okay, so you are a fresh one in front of them. So try to do your best in each station. This way, you know, you can pass the exam more easily. Don't carry things from the previous station to the next station. Okay, clear so far? <coughs> All right, so uh, today, as you know, we will be discussing uh, cardiac diseases in pregnancy. And then we will be doing uh, recurrent miscarriages, uh, the management of recurrent pregnancy loss. So once we finish with the cardiac disease in pregnancy, uh, we will do one station, okay? So that I understand that if you uh, grasp anything from what I told you or no. So I would like to, you know, look for a volunteer who will take the station uh, with me at the end of the cardiac disease and pregnancy. Can I have one? Volunteer, please. Amal, would you like to do it? I'm not sure, doctor, if I am ready or not. I really not sure. It's okay, no problem. It's just a webinar. It will be, you know, it will be just practice session for you. Okay, okay, I'll try. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you very much. So let's start uh, with the cardiac diseases. <clears throat> so, you know, cardiac diseases, they are a leading cause of maternal mortality and morbidity worldwide. And uh, the pregnancy, it induces some changes in the physiology that puts the heart on strain. So the, especially with the patients who are with the valvular disease. Our resource for the topic uh, today's session is our latest talk okay january 2023 there is a talk article about the valvular disease in pregnancy this is our resource okay so it is latest one and whatever they tell you to do so please follow this once you are performing a station uh, in uh, pregnancy with heart disease okay <clears throat> so what they are saying that uh, the regurgitant valve lesions are better tolerated in pregnancy than the stenotic lesions. Preconception guide uh, uh, counseling is very, very essential for all the women with valvular disease. And of course, these patients are on anticoagulant, so optimizing the anticoagulation is a challenge with patients with mechanical valves. So first, let's go to the New York Heart uh, Association functional classification. So we have four classes. Class one means that there is no limitation to physical activity. Ordinary physical activity does not cause any fatigue, palpitation, or dyspnea. Then classification number two is there is slight limitation of the physical activity. Patient is comfortable at rest. 
but ordinary physical activity results in fatigue, palpitation, or dyspnea. Number three is this marked limitation on physical activity. Patient is comfortable at rest, but even minimal activity can cause fatigue, palpitation, and dyspnea. And number four is the person who is unable to carry on any physical activity without discomfort. So symptoms of heart failure are there at rest, and if any physical activity is undertaken, discomfort increases. Okay? So we have four classes. Anybody would like to just repeat what type, the four types? Yes, Hafisha, can you repeat the classes, please? It is in front of you. <clears throat> uh, we have four classes of uh, heart failure according to New York. Heart Association. Class one is no limitation on physical activity. Class two, slight limitation on of physical activity and comfortable at rest. Uh, class three, mark limitation of physical activity. Uh, comfortable at rest, but less than ordinary activities can cause fatigue, palpitation, or dyspnea. Class four, unable to carry out any physical activity without discomfort. Patient may have symptoms of heart failure at rest and any physical activity is undertaken. If any physical activity is taken, uh, it may cause discomfort. Yeah, thank you very much. So if I give you a scenario that there is a female who is uh, keen to get pregnant, uh, she is unable to tolerate routine walk and she is uh, comfortable at rest, but even uh, normal activity which causes fatigue, palpitation, and dyspnea for her. So she belongs to which classification of uh, heart association? Class three. Yeah, very good. So this is how you, uh, the question will come like this in the exam, okay? The scenario will be like this, that this is a female with all these, uh, they will tell you the, uh, symptoms of the patient and then you will according you will classify what type of uh, uh, classification she belongs to and then what she will be needing in the antenatal period is she fit to embark on pregnancy or you need to delay the pregnancy or you have to counsel her strictly against the pregnancy okay so remember these this classification it's very important Okay, the other thing is the modified World Health Organization classification of maternal cardiovascular risk. Okay, this is the new one. All right, somebody want to say something? Yeah, okay, Mumal, thank you very much. Yeah, class three. Yeah, okay, so here class one, they are saying the risk of pregnancy. There is in class one, there is no detectable increased risk of maternal mortality and no or mild increase in morbidity, okay? So this is about the class one. Examples of this condition can be pulmonary stenosis, uh, patent ductus arteriosus, mitral valve prolapse, successfully repaired simple lesions like atrial or ventral uh, septal defects, PDA, anomalous pulmonary venous drainage. So num classification one has minimal risk on pregnancy, okay? Whereas uh, classification two, it has a small increased risk of maternal mortality or moderate increase in the morbidity. What are the examples of class two lesions? They are unoperated atrial or ventral septal defects, repaired tetralogy of phallus and arrhythmias. Class two and class three depends on individual, uh, mild uh, left ventricular impairment, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or tissue valvular disease, they are not classed here. <clears throat> Then how class three is affecting uh, the pregnancy? It significantly increases the risk of maternal mortality and severe morbidity. Expert counseling is required in such cases if pregnancy is decided. ICU specialist cardiac and obstetric monitoring will be required throughout the pregnancy, childbirth, and purpurum area. So examples of class three will be mechanical people with mechanical wealth, systemic right ventricle, fontan circulation, cyanotic heart disease unrepaired, other complex congenital heart diseases, an aortic dissection of 40 to 45 millimeter as in Marfan syndrome, aortic dilatation of 45 to 50 in aortic disease associated with the bicuspid aortic valve. 
So there is uh, sometimes a uh, Marfan syndrome station also, it is repeatedly coming in the exam where they will show you this dilatation. So you should be aware that at what dilatation you should tell the patient not to get pregnant and it can be aortic dissection can happen. Okay, so remember these uh, uh, measurements. Then you have class four. Uh, the risk of pregnancy in class four is high risk of on maternal mortality and morbidity. Pregnancy is contraindicated in four. Okay, so there is a patient uh, who comes. Uh, this is a station which says that pregnant patient is uh, unaware that she's pregnant. Yani she was not planning and she just got pregnant. She's a known case of pulmonary hypertension and be belongs to class four of New York Heart classification. And she's very happy and very keen to continue this pregnancy. So how you are going to counsel her? This is also one of the station in the exam. So how you are going to counsel her? She should continue or what? Yes, please tell me. She will continue, Mumal. She is belongs. She is known case of pulmonary hypertension. Very keen for pregnant. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. So, what should you? What should she do? Yes, exactly. You should counsel her for termination. Okay. This patient is not uh, going to. You know, it will be very dangerous for her to get pregnant or continue pregnancy. So you have to counsel her for termination. All right. So let's talk about stenotic valve lesions. Uh, the predominant causes of the stenotic valve lesions in women of the childbearing age are rheumatic heart diseases for mitral lesions and congenital bicuspid valves with superimposed calcification for the aortic lesions. As the volume, circulating volume increases in the normal pregnancy, there is a rise in both cardiac preload and pressure gradient across the cardiac valves. And because of the reduced ability to increase cardiac out, uh, output in these patients, because they have stenosed lesions, these changes may lead to pulmonary venous congestion and eventually pulmonary edema. So you understand that already they have stenotic valves, and the output increases and therefore <clears throat> these patients they are they don't have the ability to increase the output therefore this will lead to congestion and pulmonary edema then there are regurgitant valve lesions uh, in women of the childbearing age both aortic and mitral regurgitation arise as a complication of a rheumatic congenital or degenerative diseases women with regurgitant valve lesions they tolerate pregnancy well but there is some impact on their ability to increase the cardiac output as compared to the stenotic valves. The exceptions are the few women with severe regurgitation who have cardiac symptoms like shortness of breath or secondary compromise to the left ventricular malfunction. They are at increased risk of having a cardiac failure. Okay, <clears throat> so all patients who are with heart disease, they should go for preconception counseling. Okay, so when that station comes where the patient is coming uh, who is keen to get pregnant and she's a known case of heart disease. So here, the role of preconception counseling is very, very important. And in such stations, you will not only tell her about what to do in the preconception period, you will also talk about the antenatal, intrapartum and postpartum care to this patient, okay? You will touch everything briefly so once we will do the station, I will tell you how to go about it, okay? So in preconception counseling, it enables informed discussion and decision-making about whether to embark upon pregnancy and how it will be managed. Women who are with valvular heart disease, they should have the opportunity to meet with the cardiologist specializing in the management of cardiac disease in the pregnancy an obstetrician who is expert in the maternal medicine and obstetric physician. They should have a ECG, an echocardiogram and an exercise tolerance test. It should be performed with all women who as a baseline, okay? 
So if I say the patient is coming to you in a pre-pregnancy clinic, so what are the basic things you will uh, ask her to do if not done recently? Anybody open your mic and tell me. It will be ECG, ECO, and uh, exercise tolerance tests. Very good. Excellent. Okay. So women with a cardiac disease should be informed that they are at increased risk of obstetric complications. So obstetric complications, which are the obstetric complications a patient with cardiac disease can have? She, they can have iatrogenic preterm birth, hypertensive diseases, and postpartum hemorrhage. Okay. So why do you think patient will have postpartum hemorrhage? Anybody? No idea? Such patients are kept on what during the pregnancy? Blood thinning agents? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So if they are on anticoagulants, they are at increased risk of having a PPH. Okay? All right. Yes, very good. All right. Okay. So what are the fetal effects these patients can have? That 30% of the cases of maternal cardiac disease uh, and correlate with the maternal disease severity. So the more severe the disease is, the more risk is there. So there will be complications arising secondary to the preterm birth. There is chance of increased fetal growth restriction and certain medications which mother is taking effect of those medications on the pregnancy. So if the mother is on warfarin and she did not stop it in the first trimester, she will have problem with the uh, warfarin embryopathy. Okay, clear so far? Clear, ma'am. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so we will be discussing uh, mitral stenosis, aortic stenosis, and regurgitant wells. So women who are with mitral uh, well stenosis, they should be informed that pregnancy is usually not well tolerated. But heart failure can occur in one third of the women where the aortic valve is less than 1.5 cm. Okay, so remember that valve area of less than 1.5 cm these women, they are at increased risk of having a heart failure, okay? And in half of the women with severe well, uh, mitral stenosis, where it is less than 1 cm. So less than 1.5, they are at uh, increased risk. And the one with less than 1 cm, they are at severe risk, okay? So they might give you only this figure that the uh, valve area, aortic stenosis, or mitral stenosis, mild area is only 1.5 cm. So here, there is a moderate risk. So you will guide the patient accordingly. Or if they will say, okay, the valve area is two centimeter. So is it okay for the patient to get pregnant or no? If the valve area is two centimeter? Yes. 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 Yes, very good. So yes, if the patient is having a, a mitral valve area of uh, two centimeter, it's okay. She can get pregnant without uh, many complications, okay? There will be mild complications only. So sustained atrial fibrillation is uncommon, occurring less than 10%, but it can contribute to the development of the heart failure and thromboembolic events if it occurs. Mortality from mitral stenosis is around zero to 3%, so it's not too much. Uh, in the developed patients with predictors of the development complication, New York Heart Association classification of more than two. So if the <clears throat> patient is you know, belongs to New York Heart Association classification of more than two, such patients are increased risk of having complications uh, during pregnancy due to mitral stenosis. And then systolic pulmonary arterial pressure of more than 30, severe stenosis and advanced maternal age. So these are the risk factors which can increase the mortality and morbidity in patients with mitral stenosis during pregnancy. That is heart association of more than two classification, systolic pulmonary arterial pressure of more than 30, severe stenosis and advanced maternal age. If there are no symptoms and the patient is having a severe valve uh, stenosis of less than one, 
then they should be counseled against pregnancy. Okay, even if they're asymptomatic, but the valve area is less than one, you should tell them not to get pregnant and put them on long acting reversible method of contraception unless uh, till uh, you plan to do a surgery for her, okay? And their condition is optimized by pre-pregnancy percutaneous balloon valvotomy or valve replacement. The primary fetal consideration in maternal mitral stenosis is prematurity, which occurs in 20 to 30% and fetal growth restriction in up to 30%. So remember, once the patient is coming to you in the pre-pregnancy uh, period, you will tell her that if there is severe stenosis, you will tell her not to get pregnant and you will offer her, uh, you will put her on long acting reversible contraception and you will offer her pre-pregnancy percutaneous balloon valvotomy. Okay, and then after the procedure, she can get pregnant and you will tell her the uh, fetal complications, which are fetal growth restriction in 30% cases and preterm delivery. Clear so far? <clears throat> okay, so second thing is aortic stenosis. It is the commonest cause of left ventricular, ventricular outflow obstruction. And it is defined as thickening of the aortic valve with an anti-grade velocity across the valve of at least two meter per second. What are the early symptoms? This is reduced exercise tolerance and cardiac dyspnea upon exertion. And the progressive nature of the lesion in the absence of treatment leads to worsening of the left ventricular hypertrophy and stage cardiac failure and its characteristic symptom profile, including restnea, uh, resting dyspnea, angina, and syncope. Okay, so if the symptoms are ignored and no treatment is done, it progresses uh, gradually and it will lead to end-stage cardiac failure and you will have dyspnea at rest, angina and syncope. So in patients with aortic stenosis, a physician supervised Bruce protocol exercise test should be taken at the preconception pe uh, period and successful completion of this test suggests an ability to appropriately augment blood pressure with exercise and indicates a degree of cardiac reserve. Understood? So once you will perform this protocol, uh, Bruce protocol exercise test, then you will know that what is the cardiac reserve and is the patient able to take the stress of pregnancy or no. Measurement on cardiac biomarker NT and bro PNB in the preconception period may also indicate the severity of the underlying disease and the risk of cardiac complications during pregnancy. Okay, so if, the, if this is a case-based discussion, they might ask you these things, so remember them, okay? Then where the NT and the pro BNP is elevated pre-pregnancy, intervention should be considered before pregnancy is planned, and if within normal limits, it may be valuable measurement as pregnancy progresses in differentiating cardiac breathlessness from other causes. You understood what this line is, uh, means? Yeah? Doctor, uh, last line, can you just repeat last line? You, yeah, sure. So what it, they are saying, if uh, anti-pro-BNP, it is elevated in the pre-pregnancy area, okay? That means there's subclinical cardiac compromise. You should consider intervention before pregnancy is planned. If this is elevated, in you and patient is coming to you in the pre-pregnancy time, preconception counseling, then you should consider some intervention, like maybe she needs surgery. And if it is within normal limits, so during pregnancy, you can use it as a marker to differentiate uh, if the patient is having breathlessness during pregnancy and you have a baseline of anti uh, pro BNP in the preconception area. So you can repeat this level to compare that is this because of the cardiac breathlessness or this is some other reason of breathlessness. Maybe anemia, maybe just simple pregnancy. Understood? Yes, thank you. Okay, welcome. Okay, so the women who are asymptomatic for aortic stenosis prior to pregnancy, risk of heart failure is low, okay? Uh, it is less than 10% as compared to women who are 25%, which is 25%. So asymptomatic women, 
they the risk of heart failure is less than 10%. While symptomatic women, they are at risk of heart failure of 25%. Where there is severe aortic stenosis, a woman with normal pre-pregnancy exercise tolerance and preserved left ventricular function, it should be expected to tolerate the pregnancy well and not be discouraged. Even if so, what they are saying that even if there is severe aortic stenosis, but the patient is having a normal exercise tolerance test and her left ventricular function is preserved. So they will tolerate the pregnancy well and you can, you should not discourage them from getting pregnant. Okay. So please try to understand these lines because they will have difference. They can have any type of scenario where you will be judging that, okay, this patient can get pregnant. Should I encourage her or should I discourage her? Okay. So asymptomatic women with the normal exercise tolerance test, although the aortic stenosis is severe, they will tolerate the pregnancy well, okay? And so should be encouraged, not discouraged. While patients who are symptomatic with severe aortic stenosis and reduced exercise tolerance test should be discouraged. They should be put on long-acting reversible contraception and offer treatment. Surgical intervention is what? It is either balloon valvotomy or a valve replacement. So pregnancy accelerates decline in the valve function in women with tissue bioprocesses, while those with the prosthetic metal valve will require anticoagulation throughout the pregnancy. Otherwise, also they will be on anticoagulants. Okay, so we will be touching this uh, point again, where the, there are two types of uh, prosthesis. One is the prosthetic metal valve, other is a tissue bioprosthesis, okay? So there are different... Um, implications of both of these uh, wells. Okay, so women should be advised that preterm birth and fetal growth restriction is 20 to 25% of mothers with moderate or severe aortic stenosis can occur. And transmission of the congenital cardiac defects to infant born to mothers with left ventricular outflow uh, pathology is uh, about 10%. Fetal echocardiography should accordingly be offered routinely to such women, okay? Then mitral aortic and mitral regurgitation. Mild regurgitating wells, they are well tolerated in pregnancy because of the vasodilatation and reduced systemic vascular resistance, which happens routinely in pregnancy. While the women who are with moderate to severe disease, they are symptomatic uh, and have impaired left ventricular function, they should be informed that there is increased risk of developing cardiac failure during the pregnancy. They are increased risk of 20 to 25%. So mild is okay, acceptable, uh, while moderate to severe, they are increased risk, and there's a risk of fetal growth restriction in five to 10% of women with valve lesions, <clears throat> but there is no increase in the obstetric complications. Yeah, this is what I was talking about, valve replacement. A woman with a bioprosthetic valve who is hemodynamically stable has the advantage of not requiring anticoagulation during pregnancy. Okay, understood. So they might give you a scenario that the woman is with a bioprosthetic valve. So then they will test your knowledge. If you know that who is on bioprosthetic valve, hemodynamically stable, you will give her uh, anticoagulation or no. So just remember what is uh, there in this talk, okay? So the risk of cardiovascular complication is low in the absence of bioprosthetic dysfunction. However, up to one third of the bioprosthesis will fail within 10 to 15 years, okay? So there is a time limitation with these type of wells. So when she replaced this well, if they're saying she did uh, a replacement surgery 15 years ago, so of course now it needs replacement, right or wrong? So accordingly, either you will tell her to repeat the surgery or you will put the patient on anticoagulant. Am I clear so far? Are you following me? Yes. Okay, thank you. So mechanical replacement wells, they represent a more long-term option, but additional risk to women and their fetuses during pregnancy because of the risk of valve thrombus and the resultant need of lifelong anticoagulation. Okay, mechanical replacement needs lifelong anticoagulation. Remember that once you are doing the station. 
So antenatal management in mitral stenosis, uh, women should be reviewed at a frequency determined primarily by the disease severity and the care delivered ideally within the setting of a dedicated multidisciplinary maternal cardiology clinic. So once patient comes with stenosis, you will use the word, you will be following in a multidisciplinary maternal cardiology clinic, okay? It will be a consultant-led care in a multidisciplinary maternal cardiology clinic, and it will be a hospital delivery. They want to hear this word multidisciplinary maternal cardiology from your mouth. There is a special mark for it, okay? So women who are asymptomatic, mild mitral stenosis may be seen once in each trimester in this clinic, okay? Otherwise, they will be seen frequently like a, like a high-risk pregnancy, while those with more severe disease or symptoms should be reviewed at least monthly. So it is a joint care between a obstetrician, MDT, and maternal cardiology clinic. Routine review should include a full clinical assessment, ECG, and a screening, echocardiography, and a screening for the fetal growth restriction. So screening of fetal growth restriction means what? More frequent scans for the patient, starting from 24 weeks onwards, okay? Then medical management is uh, uh, women with moderate to severe mitral stenosis. They will need therapeutic anticoagulation because there is a risk of atrial fibrillation uh, secondary to the left atrial enlargement. <laughs> and uh, women with a history of embolism or left atrial thrombus. So they will need therapeutic anticoagulation. Anticoagulation with the low molecular weight should be considered in women with a significant low enlargement of more than 60 ml per meter square or congestive heart failure, even if there is no arrhythmia. And women with symptoms of refra uh, refracted to treatment with beta blockers, diuretics may be considered. So if the woman you are putting her on beta blocker and patient is not responding, please start diuretic for her. And uh, would you see they are developing uh, signs of pulmonary hypertension, they should be referred to the specialist centers. Okay, they are now very high risk patients. Surgical intervention. Surgical intervention is best undertaken during pregnancy with the intervention during pregnancy reserved for the women who are class 3 or class 4 or who have systolic pulmonary artery pressure of more than 50 despite medical intervention. So surgery can be uh, considered during pregnancy. If the patient, this is an unplanned pregnancy, you see the patient is deteriorating. So you can consider surgery for such patients who are not responding to the medical treatment and they belong to either class three or four uh, classification or their uh, pressure is increasing. They are developing pulmonary hypertension, okay? Percutaneous mitral balloon vulvoplasty is the intervention of choice during pregnancy, okay? So remember, percutaneous mitral balloon vulvoplasty, which can be done in the pregnancy, but should be reserved for those where medical therapy fails. Clear so far? Yes, thank you, Sarah, Mariam. Thank you very much. Okay, then we will talk about aortic stenosis. So women with aortic stenosis should be followed regularly during pregnancy. The women <laughs> with severe diseases, the frequency of cardiac assessment should be monthly or twice a monthly, depending on the symptom profile. And women who are assessed in the preconception area and advised that they will tolerate the pregnancy well. So just review them in the cardiac clinic every three months throughout the pregnancy, okay? So that means three additional visits will be there with the card cardiac physician of such women who are with aortic stenosis and they are informed that they will tolerate the pregnancy well because they have mild aortic stenosis or they are asymptomatic. Then what are the medical management? As with the mitral stenosis, activity should be reduced and medical management with the beta blockers or diuretics is initiated in the presence of uh, any evidence of incipient cardiac failure. Surgical is same, percutaneous valvuloplasty is the practical intervention of choice in women who continue to experience severe symptoms despite medical therapy. And once this is not possible and women has life-threatening symptoms, then you should consider either an early delivery by cesarean section or termination of pregnancy. Okay? All right. 
Then you have aortic and aortic regurgitation. So such patients, medically symptomatic management of heart failure, fluid overload should be achieved with the diuretics and surgery if required. Valve repair should be taken during pregnancy in cases of acute or severe regurgitation where there is heart failure refractory to the medical therapy, you should <clears throat> go for pregnancy, okay? So uh, try to uh, finish the uh, delivery should precede this. So you should, you know, uh, 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 pre prepare early delivery and then go for the surgery in the patients who are having severe disease. So there are certain anesthetic considerations which they talked about in this talk for the patients with valvular heart diseases. So you should involve the anesthetic, anesthetic in these, uh, uh, the care of these women at different stages, okay? Uh, so throughout the pregnancy, there should be a combined care. As I said, the anesthetic should be involved. So antenatally, it should be, he should be a part of the multidisciplinary team or during any admissions with the cardiac symptoms or complications. Then <laughs> once the patient comes in labor, so uh, about for the provision of labor analgesia, and if you need any invasive monitoring in the selected cases, of course, anesthetic involvement is very, very important. Then before surgery, so administration of anesthesia, what type of anesthesia they will use, either regional or uh, um, general anesthesia. And then postpartum also, if the patient is having suppose postpartum hemorrhage, uh, the patient is shifted to ICU, coronary care, a high dependency unit, so you need involvement of the NST, ZR team. Then this is again very important, anticoagulation and anesthesia. So because anticoagulants, they remain in the blood uh, and it has implications for the delivery of regional anesthesia especially. So in women receiving the therapeutic anticoagulation, okay, not the prophylactic, therapeutic, because these are cardiac patients, they will be on therapeutic doses. 24 hours elapse should be there between the last dose of the low molecular weight and the institution of the neurexial anesthesia. Okay, remember, therapeutic anticoagulation, 24 hours elapse should be there. If a woman presents within 24 hours from the last dose, then remifentanil patient control anesthesia may be considered for labor analgesia with recourse to GA if the, uh, there is a need of cesarean section. Okay, this is very important. So remember, if the patient uh, is on prophylactic therapeutic dose, you need 24 hours uh, time between epidural and uh, last dose of the low molecular weight. If the patient comes within 24 hours of the dose to taken, then they can use the fentanyl PCA or if the patient is going for uh, general, this one, cesarean delivery, general anesthesia will be used, okay? So when induction of the labor with appropriate cessation of anticoagulation is possible, preferred mode of labor analgesia would be a reliable epidural with a supplementary spinal epidural top-up for operative birth if required, depending on the case, okay? So if you're planning induction, and you have stopped the anticoagulation 24 hours before, then you can go for epidural, spinal, and epidural top-up. And the women who are on warfarin, then you have to perform an INR, and you should have an INR of less than 1.5, which at, on which you can give a spinal epidural anesthesia. Okay, clear, girl, everyone? Okay, thank you, Mariam, for the response. Okay, so anticoagulation for the valvular disease in pregnancy is mostly employed in women with the mechanical prostatic valves, although also in women with atrial fibrillation complicating native valvular disease or mitral stenosis with the high risk features. Mechanical valve prosthesis, they require anticoagulation to prevent valvular thrombosis and resultant thromboembolic complications, okay? Why you need uh, thromboanticoagulation for patient with mechanical well? Because it prevents the thrombosis and resental, <clears throat> resultant thromboembolic complications, which include well failure, 
atrial thromboembolism like stroke, MI or limb ischemia and death. Vitamin K antagonists, which is warfarin, are the most effective drugs for preventing such complications. However, because they cross placenta and they are teratogenic and leads to uh, fetal anticoagulation, so they have a limited use. Warfarin use in pregnancy is associated with fetal anomalies and at increased risk of both early and late pregnancy loss. That is why you stop the warfarin in the first trimester. The characteristic phenotype of the warfarin embryopathy is well documented and encompasses nasal hypoplasia, shortening of long bones and digits, as well as stipped, stippled long bone epiphysis. Most encountered where warfarin exposure occurs between 6 to 12 weeks of gestation, although a risk of central nervous system and ocular abnormalities with conse cons consequential neurodevelopment impairment is described with exposure at later gestation. So, what message you uh, take from here? You have to stop the warfarin where anybody can open the mic and tell. Since, um, from first trimester, even before doctor, even if the patient is on the medication, she should stop it. Is uh, first trimester, she should stop. She should yeah. not take. Exactly. And mm -hmm. if you read this line again, what you understand, if there is a need, you can give her in the second trimester, you can put her on warfarin. But again, third trimester, she has to be on the low molecular weight heparin. Yeah. Yes, before first trimester and last trimester, you should not keep the patient on warfarin, okay? Yeah. Because there is increased chance of fetal anomalies. All right, so what normally, what are the strategies which are encountered in the clinical practice? So they are, what they are doing, <clears throat> vitamin K antagonists throughout the pregnancy to reserve anticoagulant coagulant effect in mother and baby, switch to twice daily low molecular weight around two weeks before delivery. This is one strategy which is follow, people follow it, okay? Second strategy is low molecular weight in the first trimester, then vitamin K antagonist second and third trimester. But before two weeks, you stop it. They can be continued to be used while trying to conceive with the regular pregnancy testing. This is latest, okay? So vitamin K antagonists are stopped and switched to low molecular weight before sixth week of gestation. Then after week 12, again restarted and switched to the uh, low molecular weight made as above. So this is, I think, the most common one which is being used. That first 12 weeks, put them on low molecular weight heparin, restart in the second trimester, and before the <laughs> delivery, again restart the low molecular weight. Or you can use low molecular weight throughout the pregnancy. And in the preconception period where the patient is trying to conceive, they can continue this uh, vitamin K antagonist that is warfarin and they should stop as soon as the pregnancy test becomes positive. And then you continue with the low molecular weight until delivery. Clear so far? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So mitral valve, as we, dis we discussed before, that mild is uh, uh, stenosis where the uh, area is more than 1.5. Moderate is 1 to 1.5 and severe is less than 1. Okay. And so what they say, anesthetic aims in valvular heart disease, maintenance of heart rate adequate for the lesion, avoidance of the hypotension and breakthrough pain, strict fluid management because you should avoid pulmonary edema, which occurs readily if an hemorrhage is poorly tolerated, and adequate cessation of the anticoagulation. That is facilitating placement of the regional anesthesia. No, we don't stop uh, warfarin abruptly. There is a bridging of thromboprophylaxis, which we do. That is two days, okay? You start no molecular weight, you continue warfarin. And then after two days, you stop the warfarin and let the patient continue the low molecular weight. Similarly, once you are going back to the warfarin, there is again prophylaxis bridging, where you uh, have an overlap of these two for two days, okay? All right. 
Thank you. Welcome, dear. Okay, so intrapartum care, a mode of the delivery, it should be individualized. My MDT care plan should be created for all patients. Broad principles may be used to advise the safest intended mode of delivery based on the usual obstetric indication, patient choice, and cardiological assessment of the ability to tolerate the second stage of labor. Okay, so once you are discussing the plan of mode, uh, plan of birth with the patient, it should be, you should discuss, first of all, her own decision, patient's decision, okay? Then what is the safest intended mode of delivery? And if is there any other obstetric indication to go for a, a particular type of mode of delivery, like patient is having placenta previa or multiple pregnancy or transverse lie or breech presentation or polyhydramnos, any risk is there where you prefer to have a cesarean section. So that should be considered patient choice and cardiological assessment if she will be able to tolerate the second stage of labor or no. All these things you need to consider while you're planning the mode of delivery for the patient, okay? So in case of mild and moderate valvular dysfunctions, the patients who are not on therapeutic anticoagulation, you can have a normal vaginal delivery, okay? And once you are planning a vaginal birth, the use of instruments to shorten the second stage of labor may be considered like vacuum or forceps delivery. If you feel that patient is unable to push and if she pushes, there can be a problem. So you go for a instrumental delivery, okay? If there is severe hypertension or if the prolonged episodes of L-salva, uh, can uh, patient will not tolerate such long pushing, okay? So of course, if there will be continuous electronic fetal monitoring, you will <clears throat> uh, do uh, active management of the third stage of the labor and there will be one-to-one uh, -one care and one hour you will give to the patient for the passive descent of for the fetus, okay? And the patients who are with regional anesthesia uh, and of course, similarly, you will use uh, the shortening of the second stage of the labor uh, and you will recourse to the operative birth. Okay, so can you summarize, can somebody summarize what you will do at the time of the delivery? Yes, doctor, I can do. Yeah, yeah. So in the case, if the case is mild to moderate valvular uh, dysfunction, uh, these uh, cases, uh, if they are not on anticoagulation, they can have normal vaginal delivery. Yes, and, uh, very good. Yes, uh, and uh, for uh, the cases, uh, 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 of course, uh, for those uh, uh, instrumental delivery is advised to cut short the second stage of labor because pushing is not good for them. Uh, for those who with the, uh, and they need continuous electronic fetal monitoring throughout the, um, uh, their uh, labor. And um, uh, uh, for uh, those, uh, uh, for regional anesthesia also, they can take it if they are not on uh, uh, this one, uh, the, the anticoagulation. Uh, and for those with severe, uh, uh, the severe, um, the severe disease, uh, uh, their cases should be individualized. Uh, and uh, if uh, the decision uh, to, uh, of course, um, should be informed decision between the patient and the, the hair doctor, and uh, the decision uh, for uh, the mode of delivery should be agreed by the patient. Uh, if uh, uh, causing risk for her, she should, uh, I mean, advise for cesarean section, or, or else she can go for a normal vaginal delivery. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Okay, so endocarditis risk is there. So all women now receive routine antibiotic prophylaxis before the cesarean delivery. This is for all women, okay? So except for the women with the personal history of infective cardi uh, endocarditis, specific additional prophylaxis is no longer recommended, okay? So routine antibiotic prophylaxis is given as for all patients, okay? Only the patients who are with a history of infective endocarditis, there you give them <coughs> extra antibiotics. Otherwise, no. Okay? Understood? Then in the third stage of the labor, peripartum monitoring of blood pressure and pulse is very important throughout, especially in the postpartum period. It is mandatory. Invasive arterial blood pressure monitoring may be appropriate in more severe valvular diseases. The third stage of labor carries a potential 
for significant fluid shift, which should be anticipated in the multidisciplinary care plan. Okay, you, so you should inform the patient that third stage of labor, there is a risk because uh, there will be sudden shift, cardiac output will again go back. So there will be a lot of fluid which will go back to the cardiac circulation. So you should be very vigilant in this part. Uh, and there should be, you know, multidisciplinary care and very, very uh, close monitoring of the patient. The use of diuretics may be required in severely stenotic mitral lesions to prevent the autotransfusion caused by the uterine involution from precipitating pulmonary edema. You understand what will happen? That so much of fluid which was... Now it will go back to the circulation. So there will be certain uh, increased load on the heart. So this uh, part, the postpartum period is very, very crucial for patients with cardiac disease. So you have to be very vigilant in monitoring such patients in the postpartum area. Then oxytocin multidisciplinary care plan should outline as a standard the eutrotonic agents that may or may not be used, including specifying the dose and volume of the IV oxytocin. Argometrin should be avoided, as we all know. Carboprost, <clears throat> uh, uh, this will cause, you know, uh, uh, this one, yeah, they will, it, is, uh, it can cause a problem in patients with asthma or the pulmonary artery pressures. So try to avoid both of them. Mesoprostol is safe, okay? It, will, it can cause shivering as a common side effect, but it is safe. Then uh, about the anticoagulation and hemorrhage, as we all know that these patients are more prone to have a postpartum hemorrhage. So you should give them clear instructions for the dose and timing of anticoagulation after different contingencies of delivery and anesthesia are crucial for women with prosthetic wells. In womb resumption of effective anticoagulation as soon as safely possible will minimize the risk of thromboembolic complications. Postpartum hemorrhage, primary, secondary, poses a particular challenge for women with the valvular disease, especially those on therapeutic anticoagulation. Because here, because they are bleeding, so you have to stop this uh, anticoagulant. You cannot give her. So here, there are now two risks are there. One, she's losing the blood. Second, she has an increased risk of having a thromboembolism. Okay. So here, the multidisciplinary team will uh, make a decision of how to manage such patients. Then lactation, it should be encouraged with patients in, uh, with the valvular heart disease. Uh, warfarin can be taken in breast milk, okay? And it because it is an inactive metabolite and it does not, uh, very small risk to the infant. Then contraception should be long-acting progestogens, uh, including implant and injection. They are reliable and safe choice. Intrauterine devices like copper coil and marina, uh, they can be used. They are very effective. They have a very small risk of syncope. Once you are inserting them, that is uh, cervical stimulation during insertion can happen. Otherwise, they are very safe. And uh, they can be uh, either fitted immediately after delivery or at the time of the cesarean section. Okay. So I think uh, now you can attempt this station easily, right? Yeah, Amal, are you ready, dear? Yes, doctor. Okay, so read this. You have two minutes of reading time. Okay, it is a patient simulated task. Let me put the timer for you. And then we will have two minutes of performance. Okay, your time mm -hmm. starts now. Huh? Okay.
Can I start? Yeah, yeah, if you're ready, you can start. Okay. Yeah, hello, I'm Dr. Amal. I'm, uh, I'm the doctor covering the antenatal clinic today. May I confirm your name and age, please? Hello, doctor. I'm Pamela John, and I'm 31 years old. Okay, uh, and uh, how can I call you? Pam is fine, doctor. Okay, Pam, so I can see from your case note that you are here today because you are planning a pregnancy and you are having um, uh, some uh, cardiac disease. Is that right? Yes, doctor. Okay, uh, Pam, um, uh, can I ask you a few questions? Uh, uh, what is your concern, uh, Pam, today from, from this visit, your concern, your main concern? Uh, doctor, you see, uh, I'm in a stable relationship for two years, and me and my partner, we want to have a family now. That's why I'm here. I want to know, is it safe for me to get pregnant? And will it be a complication, complicated pregnancy or it will be a smooth uh, pregnancy? So just I want your opinion, doctor. I appreciate, uh, uh, Pam, that you are uh, coming before embarking into a pregnancy. That is very good from you that so that you know if it is uh, affecting you or not. So, uh, Pam, may I ask you a few questions before uh, coming to your um, uh, uh, management uh, plan and uh, also your uh, 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 and when you can get pregnant? Can I ask you a few questions before that? Sure, doctor. OK, so uh, since when, Pam, you have this uh, problem? Uh, doctor, I was having, uh, you know, once I was 15 years old, I started to feel some difficulty on breathing. I was an athlete and it started with my uh, physical activity. And then once um, I was investigated, they found out that I have severe stenosis and I needed a well replacement. Um, it was done like 10 years back. Since then, mm -hmm. I am taking medicine. I'm following with my doctor regularly. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And what uh, what uh, medications you are on, uh, Pam? I'm taking warfarin once daily, doctor. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Pam, how is your, uh, are you uh, having any symptom or uh, are you feeling okay? Uh, you said you are visiting your doctor regularly. So when was the last time you have seen your doctor? It was three months ago, doctor. And uh, yeah, I'm feeling, I'm doing well. I'm not feeling any problems. No symptoms, no like uh, difficulty of breathing. Uh, if you do any uh, like uh, activity or simple activity, you feel like you are tired, fatigued. No, doctor. I feel very well. Okay. Uh, and uh, you have never been pregnant before? No, doctor. I've never been pregnant before. Okay. And uh, do you have any other uh, um, medical illness other than this, uh, Pam? I have high blood pressure also, doctor. So I am on medicine for that as well. So you are taking, you know, the medication that you are on? Uh, I think it is amlodipine. Okay, and uh, uh, any other things that you are having, Bam? Any other medical uh, problem you are uh, following your GP for? No, doctor. Uh, and how is your blood pressure? Is it controlled? Yes, doctor. It is controlled on the medicine. Okay, and uh, uh, Bam, uh, uh, this one. I want. Uh, how is your period? Is it regular? Yes, doctor, my periods are regular, normal. And do you have any allergies to any medication? No, doctor. Uh, do you have any surgeries other than this uh, uh, valve surgery? No, doctor, only this heart surgery. Okay. And uh, you said that you are uh, living with your partner. So how is the support at home? He's very supportive. And uh, that's why I'm planning a family with him, doctor. Okay, and are you aware about your weight to height ratio? It's 24, doctor. 24, okay. Uh, what about uh, your uh, blood group? Hello? Yes, yes, I can yeah. hear you, doctor. Yeah, and uh, are you aware of your blood group? Uh, yes, doctor, it is B positive. 
positive. So any any reservation for blood trans uh, transfusion, just if uh, uh, if you need. No, doctor, it will be fine. Okay, and uh, uh, in the last few uh, uh, weeks, uh, Pam, have you felt uh, at any time that you are low mood or uh, lost interest of anything that you uh, uh, used to enjoy with? No, doctor, I'm fine, absolutely fine. Okay, Pam, uh, is there anything else you want to add, Pam? Uh, no, doctor. Okay, uh, Pam, thank you for sharing. Sorry, I just sorry, just a moment. Just, just, just a minute. Sorry. Yeah, Pam, sorry. Uh, so thank you for sharing this information uh, uh, with me, Pam. Um, uh, so um, uh, can I examine you in the presence of a chaperone just to make sure about um, uh, your general uh, well-being? Uh, okay, is that okay? Uh, yes, doctor. Okay, Pam. Uh, so coming, Pam, now to your concern that uh, uh, as you are planning for a pregnancy and uh, uh, you have uh, this uh, mechanical uh, valve. Uh, so uh, first of all, Pam, you need to know that, uh, do you know what is the effect of uh, the pregnancy uh, on your condition and also the, uh, on the, the other way, the, your condition on the pregnancy? Have you been ever uh, told or uh, read no, no, doctor. Uh, can you please tell me? Uh, yes, Pam. Uh, Pam, since you are having uh, this uh, condition, uh, with this condition also you are having high blood pressure. So uh, and during pregnancy, this might affect your, uh, uh, once you get pregnant, uh, uh, your baby might have uh, the effect of uh, 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 fetal uh, growth restriction. Might the, the growth of baby might not be the, uh, like the, the normal babies. Uh, of course, most of the, the, the women who are uh, uh, having the, the pregnancy will, will continue uh, uh, normally, but uh, for, uh, for this reason, uh, we need to uh, put you under uh, close monitoring for the, um, uh, for, uh, for, uh, the fetal uh, uh, growth. Uh, also, uh, your baby might uh, have uh, need. We might need for, uh, especially if your condition is worsening, we might need you to deliver uh, before the conditions. That is uh, the consequences uh, for your baby that might be delivered uh, before its time, uh, premature. Uh, uh, this thing. Uh, the other things that also chances of um, uh, having uh, 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 worsening of your blood pressure during pregnancy is there also. So, uh, uh, so just to. Know, uh, for you to know that. Uh, uh, also, uh, one uh, thing that uh, you need to uh, continue, since you are having a mechanical heart valve, you need to continue on your anticoagulation. But you are on warfarin now. Once you uh, plan the pregnancy and once your pregnancy is positive, you need to stop uh, using warfarin and change it to another uh, type of medication called uh, heparin. Uh, the reason for that, because warfarin is a bit, uh, um, uh, might cause some uh, abnormalities for the baby. Am I clear so far, Pam? Yes, doctor, you're very clear. Okay, and the other thing that your medication uh, that you are taking, you are uh, you told me that you have taken amlodipine, uh, right? Yes. <laughs> that we need yes. to uh, we need to refer you to the uh, cardiologist, uh, your 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 heart doctor, uh, to uh, see if we can. <clears throat> change this, this medication, or you can continue on it, sorry. <clears throat> okay, uh, uh, of course, we need to do some pre-pregnancy uh, tests to make sure that you are able to continue with the pregnancy. These are include basic tests like you need to do, uh, uh, EC, uh, ECG, that uh, electrocardiogram for, and also your uh, ECHO, that uh, uh, scan for your heart. Uh, and also some uh, uh, brief, uh, brief, uh, some uh, uh, tolerance exercise just to make sure that you are able to go through the uh, uh, stress of a pregnancy. Okay, uh, Pam, is that okay for you? Yes, doctor, it's okay. Okay, so you need to know that throughout the pregnancy, you need to continue on your anticoagulation. That is the uh, heparin medication. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, your... Uh, 
your care will be in a consultant-led unit in a, a cardiology clinic, a maternal uh, cardiac clinic. Uh, uh, like a team of doctors will be uh, taking care of you. And uh, uh, as I told you, you need to uh, uh, have a more close monitoring for your baby growth. And uh, once you are uh, uh, like near, uh, uh, near the time of delivery, you need to be assessed for the mode of delivery, whether you will go for a vaginal delivery uh, or, or if there is any other uh, obstetrical indication for having a cesarean section that also will be discussed with you. You need to know that you... oh, Sorry. It's okay. Yeah. I want you to close the station. Yeah, okay. Continue. Yeah. Yes, your care, uh, you, uh, once you are in, uh, in labor, your care will be one-to-one uh, uh, -one care uh, and uh, continuous monitoring for your baby. And you will be seen by the anesthetist doctor. Uh, uh, he will assess you uh, for uh, because you are having this uh, medication, the uh, anticoagulation, that heparin, that you need, once you are having the signs of labor, you, you, you will be advised to stop this medication 24 hours before, the, uh, the, before uh, uh, you have uh, if uh, any decision to 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 have uh, the uh, injection in the back to be to be given for you, you should uh, know that you have to stop this medication 24 hours before that, because uh, so it will not cause for you any problem. Uh, uh, the other thing uh, uh, you need to know that uh, also uh, once you uh, once you deliver the baby, uh, we need to uh, uh, manage uh, you manage the 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 stage of delivery of your placenta. Uh, uh, so that you will not have any uh, bleeding, we will need to give you uh, some um, some uh, medication to uh, uh, contract your uh, uh, uterus, your uh, womb. Uh, okay, uh, okay, Bam, are you uh, are you with me? Yes, doctor, I understand you. Uh, for your uh, for your breastfeeding, you will be encouraged to breastfeed your baby, and once you are uh, you deliver, you can go back to your uh, uh, medication that warfarin because it is safe uh, with the, with the, with the breastfeeding. Once we make sure that everything is fine and you don't need, the, you will be reviewed by by your heart doctor, and uh, we will see if there is any need to start you any medication, any new medication. Uh, and um, uh, you can uh, breastfeed your baby. Uh, after that, you will be also counseled, counseled about uh, your uh, contraception uh, that uh, that can be used, uh, which you can use the uh, progesterone-based, um, uh, this one, uh, uh, contraception, uh, or the uh, coil uh, as well will be safe for you. All right, doctor. Any other uh, question, Pam? No, doctor. Thank okay. you very much patient information leaflet and I will um, you can start your folic acid from uh, now and uh, and we can we you, I can uh, refer you to your uh, cardiac doctor okay all right doctor thank you very much doctor okay okay yes doc. tell me how you think you performed I think maybe I uh, I was uh, yeah confused and uh, not structured uh, properly. I took a uh, long time. Uh, maybe I used jargon. I'm not sure. Maybe. <laughs> yes. No, uh, no, you performed well. You have to highlight your good points first. Yeah, yeah. Don't criticize yeah. yourself first. Tell me what are your good points? Uh, yeah, I think as a case of um, uh, this one, mechanical heart valve, I have uh, to yani, make it uh, clear for the patient. She has to uh, uh, be uh, throughout the pregnancy on the anticoagulant because this is uh, needed for her to prevent any thrombosis. I mean, the, uh, the, uh, I told her about the antenatal, uh, the, the preconception um, checkup that she has to do and about also her... Uh, 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 Colleague acid said about her referral to her cardiac doctor about, yeah, these things, maybe yeah, I was, I told her. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. So you remember anything you missed in information gathering? Information gathering? Uh, yeah, a medical history card, uh, sorry, surgical history, allergies, um, smoking uh, habits. Sorry, I didn't ask about her uh, habits, smoking alcohol and... Yeah. Uh, drugs yeah that i missed uh, and what else i missed uh, her condition her history of present illness i have asked about uh, how is she feeling when her when was her last visit with the doctor yeah medical surgical uh, gynae history uh, uh, surgical history what else i don't gynae know history what, what did you ask 
I told, I asked you about your period if she, if, if it is regular and the uh, last period uh, and uh, yeah, screening, screening, I did not ask cervical screening. You did not ask about the last period and you did not ask about cervical screening and yeah. something more important. What else? In this and really uh, in general or in this case? No, no, no. In, Gaini, Gaini, this patient. What is there something else you missed in information gathering? Anybody else remember what she missed? Sexually, um, uh, contraception. Contraception, yes. yes. Yes, contraception, yeah. Okay, so what you missed in information gathering was social habits and contraception, cervical smear and last period date. Okay. Yes. Yes. Also, okay, last period is fine, no problem. But contraception is very, very important, okay? Because she's 31 years old, no? So yes. she should be, why well, she's not pregnant till now? So she should be on some contraception. So yes. what type of contraception she is using? Is it safe, reliable? So that contains uh, points. This is patient safety. Special points yes. will be there, okay? Okay. Yes. Remaining of the station, you performed very well. You were able to, you know, cover uh, most of the things in the preconception period. You told her everything she needs to uh, do, uh, what investigations she will be doing, how it will be a joint care, and uh, she will stop uh, morphine, start on low molecular weight, and then what will are the possible complications during labor. So it is nicely attempted station. Well done. I'm very happy that you were unsure that you will be able to do, but you perform very well, Amal. Good. Well done. Thank you. Anybody want to comment about uh, Amal? They can open the mic and please uh, share your opinion. <clears throat> yes, Hafishak, Mariam, Ompriya, Manikam. So many people are here. They were listening to Amal. Okay. Nobody yes, ma'am. Good. Very good attempt. Who is this um, one? Ompriya, ma'am. Yeah, very good, Ompriya. Okay. So, Ompriya, uh, would you like to take the next station with us? Yes, sure, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Very good. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, it was really very nice, uh, Amal. Well done. Okay. Thank you. Thank Welcome. you. Welcome. Okay. So, our next topic is uh, recurrent pregnancy loss. Before we do the task, we will just uh, revise what we need to address in this station. And then I will request Opriya to do the uh, station. Okay. So let's go to this. Uh, yeah. Okay. So as we know that RCOG says when the <clears throat> miscarriage happens in a row, three miscarriages it is known as recurrent miscarriages while the acog and, and other european guidelines they call it two miscarriages in a row is called a recurrent miscarriage okay so uh, there are different causes of recurrent miscarriages it can be autoimmune thrombophilia acquired and inherited there can be anatomical abnormalities there can be idiopathic reasons be unexplained that means then endocrine problems like uh, polycystic ovaries and thyroid diseases diabetes lupus disease and they can be genetic factors all of these can contribute to recurrent miscarriages okay so here as you see the biggest chunk is of the unexplained and unexplained is the one which includes the non-antiphospholipid syndrome thrombophilias uh, these, is, these are the most common type of freak, uh, miscarriages where you don't find any cause. Then 2 to 5% can be genetic factors. 20% can be due to autoimmune diseases. 0. 0.5 to 5% can be due to infections. 17 to 20% are the endocrine factors. And 10 to 15% are the anatomical factors. Okay. So here also, it is a general, uh, 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 this one, uh, treatment. So if the patient is, uh, you diagnose this as idiopathic uh, miscarriage. So you, of course, you give her a folic acid. You can give her 
dihydrogestrone and low dose aspirin. If the patient is uh, uh, having miscarriages because of PCOs, then you can give her folic acid, progesterone, and aspirin again. If it is neutral phase deficiency, all these three can be used. In PCO, the patients can be put on metformin, and you can give her clomiphene citrate for the induction of ovulation. Then in luteal phase defect, you can use clomiphene uh, if the patient is having infertility. Other endocrine disorders, you have to address the type of disorder she's having, like a patient is hypothyroid or patient is having high prolactin. So you will either put the patient on levothyroxine or for the hyperprolactinemia, you will put the patient on bromocryptine. If there are anatomical abnormalities, apart from folic acid, progesterone and low dose aspirin, if it's a weak cervix, you can uh, offer her cervical cerclage or if it is a fibroid, then you can do a myomectomy before the patient gets pregnant. Then uh, if there is a septum, if the big septum needs surgical correction, then you can perform that as well. Then genetic abnormalities, you send the patient for genetic counseling, acquired thrombophilias, you put the patient additionally on uh, low molecular weight heparin. If there is inherited thrombophilia, similar, same condition, you will put the patient on low molecular weight heparin. Autoimmune conditions, you have to start the patient on steroid apart from folic acid, progesterone, aspirin, heparin, and you will start prednisolone. And then if there's uh, multiple factors which are involved in the miscarriage, then as per the condition, you will treat the patient. Clear so far? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. So after second miscarriage for the first trimester loss, normally what you do, you screen the patient for the weight extremities. If it is very low BMI or very high BMI, you look for the social habits of alcohol and smoking. You do a scan to check if the uterine cavity is normal or no. You screen for the antiphospholipid syndrome, lupus, antiphospholipids, and anticardiolipin, IgG, IgM. And you perform the endocrine, endocrine testing. As we said, the uh, thyroid and the prolactin and the thyroid antibodies, you all check everything and you exclude diabetes by checking the HbA1c. So you manage the abnormalities in the first, second, third, and fourth accordingly whatever you find, you manage it accordingly. Then you can consider uh, prophylactic vitamin D supplementation. Now it is for everyone, you have to start vitamin D supplementation and provide psychological support. And you send the product of conception for the cytogenic analysis. <clears throat> okay, now product of conception, it comes normal. No abnormality found. It's a normal product of conception. So no further testing is required you ex do expected management. If uh, the problem of conception is, uh, there's a problem, if abnormal cavity, endocrine etiology, or there is uh, this one, and it is still uh, normal, you address the problem, the, where is the problem, okay? And if there is no identified etio uh, etiologies till now, then what you do, you consider it as unexplained cases, then you do a complete full follow-up uh, along with the expectant management. You discuss with the patient, okay, that the patient want a full workup or patient is uh, happy with the expectant management of wait and see if she gets uh, a healthy, happy baby. So what you do uh, for, uh, in a complete follow-up, you consider the hereditary thrombophilia testing. You can consider sperm DNA fragmentation testing, parental karyotyping, Uteral phase deficiency testing, chronic endometriitis testing, and a stereoscopy if there is a history of uterine surgery. And if there is an unbalanced translocation or inversion, then of course you perform directly parental karyotyping <clears throat> and send the patient for genetic counseling. Okay, then we have age related risk. This is from the latest talk that uh, from uh, 12 to 19 years, the mis uh, risk of miscarriage is 13%. 20 to 24 is 11%. 25 to 29 is 12%. 30 to 34, 15%. Now from 15%, you see a significant increase from the age of 35 to 39. It is 25%. Well, after 40, it is 51%. And more than 45, it is 93%. 
okay so age is playing a very important role in the risk of the miscarriage from 35 years onwards the risk of miscarriage is rising significantly then there are different factors which have their effects on the pregnancy loss so alcohol uh, they say there is no evidence as direct cause of the recurrent pregnancy loss but is it sensible to avoid excessive intake during pregnancy okay caffeine again there is no direct evidence but again they say that it is better to avoid alcohol and smoking during pregnancy then uh, about high intensity in exercise it, in, it poses a risk of uh, loss of pregnancy okay so you should not do a high intensity exercise during pregnancy then family history of pregnancy loss a uh, women who miscarry are more likely to have a family history of pregnancy loss okay so check the family and then this area needs further research maternal age as we already discussed that uh, risk increases with the age okay then occupational environmental exposures there is no direct cause to the uh, recurrent pregnancy loss but still uh, the advice is to avoid exposure to the hazardous substances uh, during pregnancy then father's age uh, which uh, people are not addressing that is also very very important there is increased risk of miscarriage with advanced paternal age especially once the father is more than 40 years of age okay but of course it has less effect as compared to the maternal age then previous pregnancy losses uh, increases with the number of the previous pregnancy losses as the number of you as you have more pregnancy loss there is again increased chance that you will have another pregnancy loss okay then smoking no evidence is direct but it is associated poor normally poor obstetric outcome so it should be avoided either you are active smoker or a passive smoker it should be avoided during pregnancy then stress has no evidence uh, that it causes recurrent pregnancy loss um, but recurrent pregnancy loss itself it can cause a lot of stress it's vice versa okay then BMI, uh, very high BMI or very low BMI, both have effect. So you should try to maintain a health, uh, healthy weight. Okay, clear? So there is some summary of the pregnancy loss investigation, which is used in differential, uh, different guidance. Uh, in general, um, uh, genetics, they say, this is as per RCOG, that if you're fine, uh, thinking that the uh, reason of uh, <clears throat> pregnancy loss is related to the genetic thing, then you have to do cytogenetic analysis of the product of conception uh, on the three and subsequent pregnancy loss. If unbalanced, unstructured unst chromosome abnormality is uh, found, then you perform a parental karyotyping. This is what we discussed before also, okay? Then as for uh, American guideline, they say parental karyotyping and the uh, product of conception karyotyping is useful. And parental karyotyping as per HDA, not on routine basis, analysis of the pregnancy tissue for explanatory purposes using uh, this uh, chromatography. Then hereditary thrombophilia is only women with second trimester loss. No screening unless in the court. Uh, this is different guidelines what they follow. So we will stick to RCOG, okay? So antiphospholipid syndrome, uh, lupus anticoagulant and anticardiopin antibodies on two occasions, 12 weeks apart. So remember, you have to repeat them 12 weeks apart. Then you try an anomalies. If you're suspecting, you do a transvaginal ultrasound and you might need a stereoscopy or a 3D scan. And immunology, they are not... Uh, you know, not saying anything. They said it's not there. Then genetic techniques available for analyzing products of conception. Karyotyping, failure of the cell culture, there is a rate of 20%. Maternal cell contamination can be there. Then there is uh, this fish technique. Then there is uh, array-based comparative genomic hybridization. And then there is next generation consequence. No need to remember all these things. So for this is second pregnancy loss. You do a chromosomal analysis of the product of conception. If there is no abnormality found, no further investigation. If unbalanced chromosomal translocation or inversion found, parental karyotyping. And if there is abnormality found, you perform a 
coal worker. Okay. Then what are the evidence and recommendations for the uh, endocrinal, uh, endocrinological and metabolic disorders once you're investigation, investigating recurrent pregnancy loss? So diabetes, uh, it's very important. Poor control is associated with pregnancy loss and fetal malformations. Okay. Then hyperprolactinemia, you need to treat it uh, because treatment leads to benefit. Thyroid disorders. <clears throat> you have to address the thyroid disorders and treat the thyroid disorder. Hyperthyroidism, it is not related, but hypothyroidism is related with the pregnancy loss. Okay, so you need to start the patient on levothyroxine. Then there is something called subclinical hypothyroidism. It is not associated with the recurrent pregnancy loss. Thyroid antibody, it is associated, but there is no effect from treatment. Okay. Then androgen disorders, they have no association with the recurrent pregnancy loss. Diminished ovarian reserve. <clears throat> the patient will not get pregnant in such cases, okay? Uh, so they say diminished ovarian reserve is with, uh, there is uh, no, uh, it is not prognostic value, so no need to do it. Then hy uh, hyperhomocystinemia, there is no association. Neutral insufficiency no association, neutralizing hormone, no association, polycystic ovaries, it is not associated with recurrent pregnancy loss. Similarly, vitamin D deficiency is not, uh, as per evidence, not associated with the recurrent pregnancy loss. Okay. All right. Now here, uh, again, uh, chromosomal abnormalities, uh, pregnancy tissue you are taking and you go for parental karyotyping. And atypical abnormalities, as we discussed, you perform a scan. And if there is uh, any abnormality, you go for further testing like MRI, laparoscopy, and stereoscopy. Thrombophilia, if you're suspecting, then you do uh, lupus uh, anticoagulant, anticardiolipin antibodies, IgG, IgM, and all these uh, beta 2, GP1, and GAM, IgM, that you have to assess for her hereditary thrombophilia. Then endocrinological, we already discussed thyroid and uh, uh, diabetes, HbA1c. Infection, you have to check for rubella immunity and high vaginal swab, chlamydia, endometrial biopsy, and screen. Uh, there is no evidence to perform a torch screen in patients who are having recurrent pregnancy loss. Then male factor, you can do a sperm DNA fragmentation index in patients who are having recurrent pregnancy loss. Okay, clear or not clear? Yes, ma'am, clear. <clears throat> okay, so here what it is saying, if you have a balanced chromosome abnormality, so uh, same which we have done before genetic counseling, IVF and free genetic testing can be done as optional. Okay, if you have antiphospholipid syndrome, you put the patient on low dose aspirin and heparin. I will just read RCOG because rest we are not following. Where uh, this is, I, most of the time, HRA and RCOG are same. Then thrombophilia, they say there is insufficient evidence. Similarly, endocrinology, they say in, insufficient evidence. You try in anomalies also, they say insufficient evidence and unexplained, you have to do supportive care in a dedicated early pregnancy assessment unit. This we have done before. Okay, wait. Let me now go back to the station. Yeah. Yes, Okay. So, Om Priya, you are ready? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, you have two oh, minutes of reading time. Okay. okay. And your time starts now. It is case basis. Huh? Scenario, ma'am. This is the scenario in front of you. I can't see, ma'am. It's the thank you slide. Thank you slide, huh? <laughs> no, 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 no. Wait. Everybody can see only uh, thank you slide? Yes. Yes, thank doctor. You. Mom. Uh, uh, wait, I will again, you know, yeah. stop sharing. No. 
Yes, ma'am. Now I can see. Okay. Now you can see. One, one second. No, ma'am. It was there. No. It's loading. Just give me one minute. Screen is loading. Now you can see. Yes. Yeah, Ombria, can you see this uh, uh, this one screen now? Yes. Yes, ma'am. All right. Now start reading, please. Any other slide, ma'am? No, no, this is the only slide. Okay. Take your time, try to understand because it is case based discussion. <laughs> okay, ma'am. Yes. <laughs> Other participants also, please try to write your answers in the chat box, okay? Yes, you can start now. Hello, I'm Omsia, one of the exam candidates. I've read the scenario and I'm ready for the structure discussion. Okay. Yes. Hello, doctor. So, can you summarize the case for me? Uh, yes, uh, my patient, she is a 32-year-old female and she has been referred uh, by her GP because of uh, recurrent miscarriage. She had three miscarriages between five to six weeks of gestation. Uh, she has a history of uh, a cesarean section at 32 weeks, which was spontaneously conceived. And uh, she has a boy who is eight years old and uh, healthy now. Her uh, periods uh, are regular and light, but uh, she has pain during the periods. Yeah, and uh, some blood investigations have been done, which shows the uh, uh, follicular stimulating hormone as two millionaires uh, per liter. And uh, uh, TSH is 1.9 and uh, her thrombophilia screen is negative and autoantibody screen is also negative. All right. So what is your diagnosis in her case? What do you think is the reason of her having a miscarriage? Uh, she has a recurrent miscarriage that is early miscarriage before the 10 weeks gestation. I would uh, uh, like to take a detailed history regarding uh, her uh, miscarriage, uh, how it was a spontaneous miscarriage or missed miscarriage and how they were managed. And also if any uh, medical condition she's having like diabetes or hypertension. And um, uh, I would like to take a uh, history regarding whether why the cesarean section was done at 32 weeks, whether there was any uh, preeclampsia or 
or uh, uh, fetal uh, growth restriction or any other uh, fetal indications. Uh, and also I would like to know about her partner's age and uh, yes, and yeah, okay. whether and about her. Huh. Okay, so her miscarriages were managed surgically. She has uh, three evacuations and her uh, cesarean section was done due to PPROM and there was fetal distress. So cesarean section was done. Intraoperative, postoperative was uneventful. Okay, uh, so, so now, it, uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Now, what do you think is the likely cause of her having miscarriage and her condition? You saw the investigate her uh, problem. What is her? Yeah, she is I having? would. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, is early miscarriage so a genetic uh, problem, genetic or chromosomal abnormalities of maybe might be a cause for which uh, the products of conception have been tested or not, I will be asking. And if there is any balanced or uh, in balanced translocation or inversion, then I would like to do the parental uh, karyotyping for the mom and dad and uh, whether there is any aneuploidy in the products of conception, I would like to know. Okay, the product of conception has been tested and they are normal, euploid. Okay, so it might be a case. Also, uh, uh, the uterine uh, uh, 3D ultrasound to know whether there is any, is any uterine abnormalities. Uh, okay, so what you are suspecting in uh, this case? So I if, to... uh, yeah, uh, so it might be a case of unexplained uh, recurrent uh, pregnancy loss. Uh, as all the investigations that are done are uh, normal. Okay, the ultrasound uh, is done and it shows uh, additions inside the uterus. Additions. Uh, so uh, as the miscarriages were uh, surgically managed and uh, multiple uh, suction evacuation has been done, there, is, there may be a possibility of uh, Asherman syndrome. Uh, the multiple additions uh, in the uterus. Uh, so, uh, and that might be the cause of the uh, light bleeding during the periods and uh, the pain during the periods. Okay, so how you are so, going to manage her case? Uh, yeah, so uh, I would like to do for the assurance as she's having pain and during the periods, I would like to uh, do a hysteroscopy and uh, see uh, mm, uh, the degree of the severity of adhesions and uh, might do uh, uh, like to do a uh, uh to release all the adhesions and uh, um, yeah and provide her with uh, follow up with the recurrent pregnancy loss uh, clinic so that she receives appropriate support. And uh, whenever she uh, gets pregnant, uh, we'd like to see her early on in the pregnancy and uh, yeah, in the dedicated early pregnancy assessment unit. Anything else you want to do after uh, this uh, doing a visualizes? Yeah, after the visualizes, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I would like to put uh, the uh, T-shaped device, uh, the copper coil, removing the copper and putting it so that uh, there are no formation of uh, re -adhesions. And uh, like to also start her on the estrogen uh, and uh, progesterone pills so that there is buildup of the endometrium and uh, uh, the additions, uh, recurrence of the additions is reduced and uh, she can plan for the pregnancy after three to six months. And we will start her on folic acid and uh, also vitam vitamin D and check for the rubella immunity. Anything else you want to start for her? Uh, low this, dose aspirin, uh, may, low dose aspirin may be start. Hello, uh, low dose aspirin Anything can be else? started. Anything else for the rebuilding of the epithelium? I'm not sure, ma'am. Mm -hmm. It's okay, no problem. Okay, tell me a few other causes of recurrent pregnancy loss. Yeah, causes of uh, recurrent pregnancy loss include anatomical abnormalities of the uterus and uh, 
uh, genetic abnormalities in the uh, fetus uh, and um, uh, yeah, uh, antiphospholipid syndromes inherited thrombophilias, uh, <coughs> protein C, protein S uh, deficiencies, and uh, and uh, endocrine uh, diseases like uncontrolled uh, diabetes or hypothyroidism and hyperprolactinemia. Okay. So if the patient is having a recurrent pregnancy loss, first trimester loss, what is the most likely cause? Most likely cause is uh, genetic abnormalities of the fetus, like aneuploidy or uh, unbalanced translocations. Mm -hmm. <coughs> or it okay, may be unexplained. The patient is having second trimester. Oh. What about the second trimester? A pregnancy loss. What is the most common reason? Uh, cervical incompetences, cer cervical incompetence uh, leading to painless uh, dilatation and uh, loss. And it can be uh, uh, due to uh, thrombophilias like uh, inherited or acquired like antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And uh, yeah. Okay. So how you will manage a case with patient who is uh, having an incompetent cervix? Yeah, uh, more than two uh, cervical, uh, uh, second trimester loss and uh, due to the cervical incompetence, uh, that is, we can, do, uh, sorry, uh, more than three. Uh, so we can do the history-based based circlage for the uh, patient uh, at uh, around 14 to 16 weeks. And uh, if there is one or two losses, then we can do the uh, ultrasound monitoring of the cervical length. Uh, 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 yeah, ultrasound monitoring of the cervical length every uh, four weeks. And uh, we can also start for prophylactic uh, progesterone uh, vaginal suppositories if it is uh, less than uh, 2.5. Okay, so the length of the cervix, what length of cervix you are looking for to call it? Uh, 2.5 centimeter. Yeah, 2.5 centimeter is the cutoff. Less than it uh, is called the incompetent os. Short service. Oh. All right, fine. <clears throat> and uh, what about the patient who is having antiphospholipid antibody syndrome? How you are going to manage it quickly? Yeah, we will start her on low dose aspirin and low molecular weight heparin as soon as the uh, cardiac activity is confirmed on the ultrasound. And you will continue till when? Uh, continue till the uh, delivery of the baby. And postnatally? Um, postnatally, six weeks. Sorry. Six weeks postnatally. Six weeks. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. All right. That is all. Thank you very much. And your time is also only one second left. Finish time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Om Priya. You perform very, very well. Very good. I'm very happy. You reached the diagnosis. Uh, other uh, candidates, I don't know, nobody wrote their uh, diagnosis. I wanted everybody to understand what is, because I was thinking you will not reach the, to the diagnosis. But very good. I'm very happy that you performed well. And uh, through your, you know, <clears throat> the way you started answering the question, that is how you got to the diagnosis. Otherwise, if you were not asking this type of questions, you will, not, you will never reach the diagnosis. Okay. So this is a case of Asherman syndrome. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. What? Yeah. No need PP. Postpartum. PP? Postpartum. Ah. If starting for apply and recurrent miscarriage, no need of postpartum thromboprophylaxis. I think that she won't. That she needs. No, Savati. Uh, any patient who is antenatally on enoxaparin uh, uh, or low molecular weight heparin, we should continue it at for six weeks postnatal. If I am not wrong, this is what the RCOG says. Irrespective of the reason you started it for, if you give any patient antenatally low molecular weight heparin, you continue it for six weeks <laughs> postnatal. <laughs> Okay, so there was one question which I asked you that what you should put her on ap uh, apart from the device you inserted, you should give her exogenous estrogen for the rebuilding of the endometrium, okay? 
okay i told that okay i think estrogen and uh, okay maybe i missed i'll uh, put okay, the so copper coil uh, without the copper and estrogen progesterone for the building of endometrium yeah yeah, okay, yeah only estrogen to... only estrogen no progesterone only estrogen okay 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 all right yeah so what you are saying if no history of vte no no there is we are uh, so it is not about the history of vte or no if any patient you are starting antenatally on from the beginning of pregnancy on low molecular weight heparin you continue this patient on heparin till 6 weeks of postnatal okay you don't stop it. Uh, yes please swati tell me uh, 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 that is uh, that is if there is history of thromboembolism if we are starting for v, uh, prevention of venous thromboembolism then it is only indicated but if we are giving for apla and recurrent miscarriage then it is i think it is not indicated postpartum i am giving for only no, okay. for apla if it is in if it is associated with history of venous thromboembolism then only it is to be uh, continued postpartum what Your i think voices. so i need to revise it uh, no because what i remember uh, we follow that vta thromboembolism chart okay so as per that all patients who are started aging that's what i'm saying irrespect of why you started her on low molecular weight you continue for six weeks postnatal okay i will also reconfirm and i will get back to you okay this is what i remember Maybe I am also wrong. It can be a possible. Anybody has uh, anything to add or to correct us? No, ma'am. Need to confirm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 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 I will also read back and I will get back to you people. Okay. We will be making a group. So uh, that's all about the session today. Uh, I will just briefly tell you about the. Uh, 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 this course which we are having, uh, there is one to one course uh, by med exam. I will be the mentor in that course, and we are having fourteen uh, sessions in uh, that course, which is already started. We had one session, and it will be covering all the fourteen modules which are required for the part three exam. Each session we are doing almost seven stations each. Uh, so that makes around 98 to 100 stations all from the previous exams. And we are providing extra stations or templates for the other uh, topics which are remaining from the, you know, which you cannot cover everything in the session. So there are extra stations, templates freely available, material uh, guidelines, summaries are available. So if anybody want to join us, they are more than welcome. You can contact the med exam team for uh, further assistance. Okay. And we will be doing a few more free webinars. Anybody, we will be making a group also on WhatsApp for the people who will be sitting in the May exam to help them and guide them. So those who are confirmed for May, uh, please join that May group and uh, we will be guiding you there. Okay, any questions anyone has? No, ma'am. Thank you. Ma'am, where okay. is this Asherman uh, given treatment? Sorry? This Asherman syndrome uh, treatment is there in the talk? From the strategy. Strategy, okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry, all the resources are from RCOG, okay? Because we are giving RCOG exam. Yes. Okay, so I hope you found the session uh, helpful and it cleared your doubts. So hopefully we will uh, be, you know, meeting again in another webinar and in the group for the May people. And uh, I will be available for uh, uh, clearing your doubts and guiding you for the part three exam. Thank you very much for joining in.